Welcome back. In the last video, we talked about the different ways that you can transfer heat from one source to another. So we talked about conduction, convection, and radiation. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit more about that last one, radiation, and how when you heat up something, it actually starts radiating energy. And we can define the energy that's being radiated by its power and its wavelength. So in this video, we're going to talk through some of the calculations that can go behind uh, this idea and quantify some of these measurements that will be really important for us um, when we talk about climate change and then ultimately in our next unit when we talk about astrophysics. And it kind of feels weird, but we're going to start this topic that is very, very closely related to astrophysics with a pretty simple uh, scenario, one that you have probably experienced before. If you think about this um, situation, you have a car that's in uh, just parked in a parking lot on a nice sunny day, which color car is going to heat up the most in the sun? Now, you've probably experienced this in some fashion or another, whether it's a car or something else. You probably have some awareness that black is a color that absorbs more light. White is a pretty reflective color, uh, doesn't absorb any of the wavelengths, and then reflects that light back. So it doesn't heat up as much, but black absorbs all the wavelengths of light and then ultimately heats up more, transfers that light into thermal energy. A black body radiator is what we call an object that is perfectly absorbing. So the official definition is an object that perfectly opaque and absorbs all energy. And it's kind of weird to think of that because that doesn't truly exist. Yeah, there isn't a scenario that you're gonna see something that absorbs all light, um, all of that energy. There are some new colors like Vanta Black uh, that absorb like 99.9% .9 of the light. Um, but when we think of a black body radiator, radiator, the conceptual model that we use is it's like, imagine you have this sphere that has a little tiny opening that allows light in, but then it can never find that opening again. So any light that um, comes in is there forever. It's basically bouncing around fully absorbed and transferred into thermal energy. Now we're gonna use this as kind of our baseline for a, a property that we call emissivity. Emissivity is actually a ratio. It's the power radiated by a surface divided by the power radiated by a black body of the same temperature and area. So um, basically it's gonna be some ratio of how close it is to a black body radiator. And this number is always gonna be between zero and one. Um, a black body is totally absorbing. Um, so it fully absorbs everything and it will fully emit everything then as thermal energy. A shiny body is something that reflects everything. Um, so whereas a black body would have an emissivity of one, a shiny body would be an emissivity of zero. Now a gray body is what most of the objects that we actually deal with are. Um, that some is absorbed and some is reflected. Now, when we talk about stars, like our sun, uh, the best approximation for them is actually that they are pretty close to a black body radiator, which is kind of weird to think about because they don't look black, um, but they are perfectly emissive, um, which means that we give the sun and most stars an emissivity of about one. And generally, a good rule of thumb is if an emissivity value is not given to you in a problem, we're going to assume one. We're going to assume a black body radiator. In uh, the case of the Earth, the Earth is not a black body radiator. Instead, our best estimate for the Earth, and there's a variety of factors that will come into play that we'll talk about more in the next lesson, the Earth, we say, has an emissivity of about 0.6. You don't need to memorize that. It will be given to you in a problem if you ever need it. Now, where this is an important property for us is it's a, a big factor in our first main equation for today. And that equation is known as Stefan Boltzmann's law. And this is what the equation is. It's P is equal to E sigma A T to the fourth. And we're going to talk about that. Um, let's define these different parts of the equation because this is a big one in this unit, but it's even bigger in our next unit when we talk about astrophysics. So P is uh, our symbol for power. Power is measured in watts. We have seen that in actually a couple different units so far this year. E is that unit that we just talked about, emissivity. Uh, the full ratio is given here 
but we're going to assume one in almost all cases. If it's not one, it will be given to you in the problem because it's a special case. Sigma is actually uh, a constant. It's in the data booklet for the IB class. Um, it's known as Stefan Boltzmann's constant, and it's 5.67 times 10 to the negative eighth watts per square meter per Kelvin to the fourth. Um, and that will always be that value, no matter what. A is going to be the surface area. The surface area is going to be measured in meters squared. Um, now, this is going to be a sphere in almost all cases. If we're talking about a star, um, or even if we're not, we're going to almost always assume that it's this perfect spherical ball. Now, you may or may not remember what our surface area formula is for a sphere. Um, but there's actually kind of a clever trick and I want to show you real quick. So we're going to cut to that video right now. All right, I've got an orange here um, and I'm going to go ahead and trace this orange. Get a rough sketch of its diameter. So I traced this orange four times. Now I'm going to go ahead and peel this orange uh, and see what happens with that peel. As you can see, uh, the peel of the orange, the orange being roughly a sphere, uh, has a surface area that is approximately four times the, the surface area of just a circle of the same radius of that orange. All right, now that we're back, uh, you should have seen from that demonstration that a surface area of a sphere is given to you by this formula, four pi r squared. It's basically four times the surface area of a circle of the same radius. And then this last component here is T. T in this case stands for temperature, and temperature is raised to the fourth power. Um, the most important part here that you need to remember, the easiest thing to get wrong, is that T, the units matter. T is our absolute temperature, and absolute temperature must be measured in Kelvin. Um, so if you are ever given the temperature in Celsius, you must convert to Kelvin just by adding 273 degrees um, to make it absolute. So if you are given four of these five variables, you can always find the fifth. The key things to remember again, temperature must be in Kelvin. Make sure you raise that to the fourth power, which is kind of weird. Um, sigma is a constant. E is usually going to be one. And then A is almost always the surface area of a sphere, which is four times the same area of that circle. With this in mind, um, let's go through a problem here. Star has a radius uh, that's provided here and a surface temperature here in Celsius. Calculate the power it emits. Now E we're going to assume is 1 because uh, it's not given to us. A star is typically assumed to be a black body. Sigma is provided here. That is a constant. A is the area. and I've calculated that out for you here. 4 times pi times the radius squared. That gives us 8.66 times 10 to the 16th meters squared. There's a huge surface area, but it's a star. That kind of makes sense. And T is um, calculated here in Kelvin, 7,773 degrees Kelvin. If this is our equation, I'd like you to go ahead and find a calculator. I'd like you to calculate what that power should be for this particular star. How many watts are emitted? All right, if we plug in those numbers, one, the sigma value, our area, and then our temperature raised to the fourth power, we should get a power of this star about 1.79, 1.8 times 10 to the 25th watts. That's a huge amount of power. Um, in our next lesson, we're going to talk about this in terms of the sun and how we can actually calculate the power emitted by the sun using some clever math, and then using our distance from the sun, figure out how much power the earth is actually being, actually receiving uh, from that initial wattage that the sun is emitting. There is another factor here that I just want to stress one more time on this particular equation. Stefan's Boltzmann's law has this weird raised to the fourth power. It's actually the only equation I can think of um, in physics that has uh, an exponent of four uh, involved. 
Now, if we were trying to compare one to another and create this proportionality, and I wanted to figure out, okay, how much more heat energy is radiated from a cup that's 80 degrees Celsius compared to 20 degrees Celsius? Now, if I were to plug that in, I need to use the, the temperature in Kelvin. So I'm gonna add 273 to each of those values. And then really what this is asking me is, what is the ratio between those two powers? So E sigma A T to the fourth um, for the first temperature and the second. Now, in this case, I'm not given really any information about any of these other values, but we can assume that they're all the same because it's the same object, same emissivity, constant is going to be the same, and then the area is also going to be the same. That's not changing for these two cups of coffee, or two cups of water in this case. So we're going to actually just cross off all those other things, that this is just a proportion between t to the fourth and t to the fourth, uh, plugging in these values accordingly. And if I do that, I can calculate that out um, to say that this cup of coffee actually has about 2.1 times more power, more energy that's being dissipated uh, based on these temperature values. So you should be able to compare one to another just by looking at um, this equation and setting them, setting them apart from each other. All right, the other equation that we're going to talk about is how the energy that's um, being radiated translates to a wavelength. When a black body radiator is heated up, it's actually going to emit a range of different wavelengths. Right now, you are radiating energy. You have heat. And that energy is being radiated at a certain wavelength of electromagnetic light. Now, that feels kind of weird because you're not glowing. Um, but it is part of the same process. If you were to heat up even more, which is not going to happen to this extent, um, but above a certain temperature, you're actually going to start emitting visible light, um, which feels crazy in this particular instance. But you've actually seen this before. If you heat up a toaster, um, you can see those toaster coils start to glow. Let's check that out right now. All right, here I am in my kitchen to show you how a toaster is going to glow if it heats up enough. So here I have a toaster. I'm going to push it down a little bit, let it start to heat up. There are a couple coils inside the toaster that are set up so that when they have enough current running through them, they start to heat up. Now, if it raises above a certain temperature, that heat actually starts to create a wavelength that glows in the visible part of the spectrum. So if I flip my camera here towards the toaster, you can see that inside those wires are glowing. Um, and I could actually take that frequency, that wavelength that they are glowing at, and calculate exactly how hot the different coils are inside the toaster. Pretty awesome. So in that toaster setting, we were actually seeing some of the wavelengths stretching into this visible part of the spectrum. Now, this is what the curve looks like of the different wavelengths that are being emitted. Many of them here are above the visible wavelength. That's in the infrared part of the spectrum. Um, but some here start to come into this visible. Now, one of my favorite things in physics, there's this uh, instance called the ultraviolet catastrophe, which sounds way more dramatic than it is. It's just the predicted value um, of what these wavelengths would have been. Uh, the prediction was that if you heat something up, it's just going to produce an infinite amount of the high wavelengths and then just change according to the intensity. But the reality is we get this weird hump that's going on, um, and that hump can give us a peak frequency. Now, when we talk about something glowing hot, like I was mentioning, a lot of this shows up in the infrared. Like a burner could be on, it could be very hot, but not glowing yet, um, because it has not quite reached the temperature in which it would start to glow. Um, but once it does, we can see this visible light always starting in the red part of the spectrum. So the first part of this peak that's actually gonna be hit is the red side. If you start to heat up even more, um, you don't just go like red, now it's yellow, now it's green, now it's blue. That's not how something glows. Instead, it's going to have a combination of all the visible colors of light, which then when combined form white light. So if something is going white hot, uh, you are seeing all the different wavelengths of light kind of combining together. Now, those last graphs didn't really do this scenario justice because what's actually happening here is if we were to increase the temperature, we get a different curve every time. Um, and as the temperature goes up, 
two things change about this graph. The first thing that changes, the most obvious one, is that the intensity goes up. That kind of makes sense. The hotter it is, the more wavelength is being emitted, the more radiation is radiating. But the other thing that's kind of interesting here and almost surprising is that as you increase the temperature, you decrease the maximum wavelength, the peak wavelength that's in here. Um, and that feels strange, but when you think about what that means, is decreasing the wavelength is actually increasing its frequency if the speed of light is the same. So here, something that's like 4,000 degrees Kelvin is not gonna emit too much visible light. Um, it's mostly gonna be here in the infrared part of the spectrum. But as it gets hotter and hotter, this peak frequency stretches more and more into the visible spectrum. Now, this peak right here can be predicted by this displacement law. This is our second of two main equations for today. This peak frequency or peak wavelength, we call it lambda max, uh, can be predicted by this relationship here. It's a constant 2.90 times 10 to the negative third divided by the temperature in Kelvin. This can be used to calculate some things. So if we wanted to calculate the emitted radiation, the max wavelength uh, for the sun with this surface temperature, all we have to do is just plug it into that equation. Just plug it in for T in Kelvin. We find that the wavelength is about 5.02 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. That in nanometers is about 502 nanometers. With that in mind, I'd like you to look at this visible light spectrum. What is the most prevalent color in sunlight? You can see the wavelength written down here. Somewhat surprisingly, the most prevalent color is green. It doesn't mean that the sun glows green. It's just that is the most prevalent wavelength that is there.